Welcome back. Good morning. I'm Pastor Gary Glenny, and you are uh, tuning in to Grace and Truth Bible Church. It's our Sunday morning second service, first service, 10 o'clock. This is the second service, so welcome. Uh, we have class uh, all here on uh, 10 and 11.15 right now. And after our second hour, we have time where we sing the great hymns of the church, a little fellowship, some time to worship in song. If you'll join with us, we'd really appreciate adding your voice to the melody uh, and the harmony, if you so choose. We thank you for that. On Thursday, we have class at 7 o'clock. And on Thursday, we have uh, the study of... Um, Ephesians, which we're working through chapter four and some really great things over there. And then on Wednesday, my wife, Judy, has a class right here for the ladies at two o'clock Wednesday, currently going through some some studies in the book of Revelation. As I mentioned, the first hour, she kind of bit off a, a huge chunk because Revelation is a, a rather detailed study. I had a pastor one time said it's the easiest Greek in the New Testament. The trouble is that uh, it's kind of Grand Central Station for all the Old Testament prophecy. Everything feeds into it as everything feeds out of Genesis. Everything feeds into Revelation. So you need to have a background in the whole Old Testament and all the prophecies of the uh, Old Testament prophets and every other study in order to really understand the book of Revelation. It's a great study. Uh, of course, most of it doesn't even apply to us. And that's uh, the good news. Uh, most people are so fascinated with Revelation. And from chapter 4 through 19, it really doesn't pertain to us because it's going to pertain to the people here left after the rapture and we're gone to be with the Lord. But it is instructive to warn people so that they don't stay here during that terrible time of the tribulation. It's going to be the worst time on planet Earth. People think they've had hard times in the various uh, world wars uh, and various uh, plagues that have come on Earth. But uh, other than the great flood of Noah, it's going to be the worst time in human history. It's going to be short, only three and a half years, seven altogether of tribulation. But it's going to be a terrible time. And at the very least, as giving the gospel to the unsaved so that they join us in heaven and do not go through that terrible time. Obviously, people will, and people will get saved during that time, but for the most part, they will be martyred and killed for their faith. It's going to be a, a rough time to be around. So to avoid that, now is the hour. Uh, I remember Billy Graham used to say, this is now is the hour of salvation. And that's true now more than ever, because we believe that the Lord may return at any moment. Well, again, thank you for coming. Remember that uh, at Grace and Truth Bible Church, we teach the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. I teach from the original languages of Scripture. Hebrew and Greek, Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. The only reason I say that is that I am. In, it's the imperative of uh, of a, being a pastor to make sure that I have a correct interpretation, exactly as God ordained it and inspired the writers of Scripture to pen it, and therefore that you get exactly the undiluted Word of God from this teaching. We thank you for joining with us and being a part of our congregation. And of course, again, just, just a reminder, if you'd like to give to the Ministry of Grace and Truth Bible Church, you can do that. We never beat the drum for giving because every person, according as they purpose, in their own heart, so let them give not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you can give on the grace basis, freely and only as a believer, we appreciate those gifts that help to continue this ministry. We don't have a lot of expenses here. We do want to support some missions, and obviously every ministry has expenses. We thank you so much. Those who have supported us prayerfully as well as financially, you can send checks or money orders to this home address, but make sure on the envelope you put Grace and Truth Bible Church as well as on any check or money order. We are so grateful and appreciative of those who give to this ministry. We thank you. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> it is our custom, of course, at the beginning of each of our Bible studies to take a moment for silent prayer. Most of you who have been with us understand this. It's nevertheless essential because there may be new people joining with us this very hour. And we want you to understand if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to make sure you have no unconfessed sin in your life. 
you have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit enables or fills you as you are in a forgiven, sinless condition. The way that we are in a forgiven, sinless condition is as a believer to confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we, believers, confess our sins moment by moment, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that is, uh, whenever we name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us those sins that we mention, and at the same time to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe this picks up the ones we forgot about or didn't know that we had committed. In fact, we ought to do this moment by moment throughout the day but especially before Bible study, so that we have the mind of Christ and the enabling of the Holy Spirit to understand the things that God has designed for us. So with that in mind, and in preparation for our study in this second hour, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that lives and abides forever. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who provided our so great salvation. We thank you for the eternity that you've provided for us and that Jesus Christ is now preparing a home for us in that heavenly Jerusalem. We thank you for all these things. We pray that as we study in this hour, that you would enable our hearts to comprehend the things of scripture that you have for us. So to better enable us to fulfill the ministry that you've given to each one of us and collectively as a church body. We thank you for these things. We pray for the edification now of our souls and we pray it in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen and amen. What was that? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are studying in the book of Philippians, we've taken a side journey into the presentation of the clear understanding of the gospel message in the last hour. But it's based on the passages that we have in the first chapter of Philippians, where we see the word gospel occurring six times, and of course two more times in the fourth chapter. So one of the things that Paul wants to make clear is this gospel information. He even expresses the fact that the gospel is increased by the fact that he has been incarcerated, probably in Rome at this time, and therefore that incarceration has led to an increase in the desire of people to be saved. And in fact, the Praetorian Guard, that is the police officers, uh, chained to him day by day and hour by hour are receiving the gospel and carrying it outside the Praetorian, that is the uh, police station, if you will, to those around so that many in Rome are hearing the gospel because of Paul's imprisonment. So he makes quite an issue of this from verse 12 all the way down uh, into verse 18 and 19, the fact that the gospel is getting broader acceptance because of his incarceration. And the principle that we get from this, as we noted, and we'll mention again several times, is that the adversities in life, uh, including imprisonment, uh, often give us the opportunity for greater exposure for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, because of that, I rejoice, and again, I rejoice. And so he is joyful of his imprisonment, not because of his imprisonment, but because of the fact that the gospel is expanding and that people are taking uh, and having more confidence because if he can evangelize under adverse circumstances, certainly those in freedom ought to do the same and give that gospel presentation. And so we have uh, this information. We noted verse 12 last time. I think we've finished up uh, this. I think we're actually in verse 12. So we'll take a quick run through of that verse 
and then we'll go back to our study of the biblical means of salvation from condemnation and those salient pieces of information that need to be part of the gospel presentation. In the epistle to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers, that my imprisonment has turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And so we see he mentions the gospel in chapter 1, verse 5, again in verse 7, here in verse 12. He will mention it again uh, in verse 16 and twice in verse 27. So eight times he mentions the word gospel in chapter 1. Two more times in chapter 4 as he closes out this epistle. So obviously one of the focus or the foci of Paul in the epistle to the Philippians is the gospel presentation. Now all of the information pertaining to the gospel is not housed in these verses. And we noted the word gospel itself has to be interpreted in the context in which it is found. Obviously, the gospel here and elsewhere in the New Testament primarily focuses on phase one. By phase one, we mean the information that needs to be believed to have eternal life. It occurs in a moment of time by believing the information that is part of the gospel. We noted that the word gospel itself which means good news, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. We've noted the word euangelia, good, you, and angelia, from where we get the word angel, a good message. However, throughout the Bible, the good news does not always mean phase one salvation, entrance into the plan of God. It might be good news that a soldier comes back from the war and says that we've had victory. That was certainly good news. Or I mentioned in Proverbs, I believe, where it says that they came from the mountain and brought snow so that those in the hot uh, desert area could have refreshing, cool water. And they were bringing, therefore, good news from the mountain. So good news could be any type of good news mentioned in the Old and New Testament. But the one that we have here is the technical sense of phase one. By the way, the gospel extends beyond simply entrance into the plan of God by believing in Jesus Christ. It also implies uh, the Christian life. So the gospel extends into the Christian life and the gospel even extends to resurrection body. That would be the full gospel, if you please. But normally when we see this word, it refers to phase one. The means of salvation, of course, are belief. Belief in the information pertaining to eternal salvation. We have listed the fact that there are five uh, things that we believe are essential. There are others who reject that and say, all you need to do is believe in Jesus. We noted the fact that there are many Jesus. We know that there's a Mormon Jesus. Uh, there's a uh, Muslim Jesus. There's a Jehovah's Witness Jesus. There are Jesus people with that name south of the border. That's not the Jesus we're talking about. The Jesus we're speaking about is the Jesus of the Bible. In the first hour, we looked at all of those things pertaining to who this Jesus is. Much of this information I received uh, in a great book, uh, Getting the Gospel Wrong by J.B. Hickson. Uh, he is a great theologue and does a tremendous job of showing the wrong gospel as opposed to the things that are essential. Now, we noted in the first hour that God is gracious, and even if your gospel presentation does not include all that we believe need to be included, the assumption is that the person you're communicating the gospel to might understand the other things, or God's grace might accept the fact that this person's heart is right with him, and therefore accept them as having believed. But I believe that in order to make sure that we do not confuse the issue, we need to include all five of these things. In addition, uh, one of my mentors in the past, Dr. Earl Rodmacher, who was uh, one of the founding people in uh, Western Conservative Seminary years ago and has founded several other seminaries uh, since then, was also a speaker at Campus Crusade for Christ when I was there uh, as a, uh, a young Christian going through the training uh, to be on the Athletes in Action weightlifting team. And Dr. Rodmacher was teaching at that time a class in the Book of Romans. 
and I kind of sneaked out of the class I was supposed to go to and went to the class that Dr. Rodmacher was teaching. Uh, he was a great teacher, one of my mentors. And again, I talked to him after class and I said, I feel like I might have the gift of pastor teacher. And he said, and I said, but I wasn't really great in languages. I had French and Latin. And I, he said, well, what was your degree? And I said, well, my degree is in mechanical engineering. He said, well, that's great because if you become a student of the languages of scripture and you have that uh, mind to analyze, that would be a great help. And he said, my suggestion is to take a class in Greek or Hebrew and see what you think. And God will encourage you if you are to have a ministry as a pastor. And I studied the Greek and fell in love with it immediately. And of course, being able to exegete and to dissect the language, both Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, uh, became something that became, for me, a lifelong study. And so I really appreciate Dr. Rodmacher. And he wrote the foreword to this book. And so he endorses, along with Charlie Bing and a host of other evangelicals. So those naysayers, to the contrast, these are those five things that are part of the gospel message. In the first hour, we talked about the Jesus of the Bible. First of all, he is undiminished deity. He is God, totally God, and he is human, totally human through the virgin birth. And his humanity is sinless. I think it's important that we understand that otherwise he could not be the savior unless he was totally God and totally human in one person and that he was sinless. Otherwise, he couldn't uh, uh, go as the uh, intermediary between God and uh, ourselves. So that's the first thing. We noted some passages. We could go through the deity of Jesus Christ, a plethora of passages. I've listed some of them here. John 1, 1 through 3, John 10, 10, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, John 1, 1 through 3, and 10, and John 10, 30, 1 Corinthians 4, 4. We have a host of these listed here for you. And then the true humanity of Jesus, everywhere we see that he was born of the virgin, uh, he was a true human being in every sense, except he was born without the sin of Adam, no old sin nature, no Adamic sin, no personal sin, therefore qualified him as a sinless sacrifice to go to the cross. Number two, it says that he is the son of God. Of course, as the son of God, that is an indication of the relationship between himself, the father and the Holy Spirit. He's the second member of the Trinity. He's not a son in that he was uh, born as a secondary uh, God or of a mother God and a father God. He is a son in the relationship to the father as responsible to the father and the father as being the instructor to the second member of the Trinity, particularly in his humanity. He received from the Father and through the Holy Spirit whatever he had in his humanity to function as a true human being, although in every way God. He did not use his attributes, so he rendered inoperative his independent access and operation of his divine attributes while on earth, only using what we have, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, and the will of the Father. In fact, he said, even to the crucifixion, not my will, but thine, that is the Father's will, be done. So it says here, uh, uh, in terms of John eleven twenty seven, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. This is what we see in John eleven twenty seven. We also see that Paul spoke about the fact that Christ died on the cross. So the cross is essential to understand. In fact, Paul said, I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, we don't find the crucifixion specifically stated in John 3.16 or in Acts 16.31. But the salvific work of Christ demands the crucifixion and the bearing of sins. And Paul includes it even though not in those specific passages in Acts 16.31 or John 3.16, but he certainly includes the cross in his message in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, where he says that uh, I determined to know nothing 
among you except Christ and him crucified. So we need to recognize the cross of Calvary in our gospel presentation somewhere. That is the basis of our salvation. Not just believing in any Jesus, but the specific God-man Jesus, and that he died on the cross, as Paul says, and was crucified. Not only that, Paul says, I've delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Not only did he die on the cross and was crucified, but he did it for a purpose. He died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So the cross is essential, his death and the payment for all sins on that cross. Somewhere in your gospel presentation, that needs to be stated. I always include that in my gospel presentation at the end of every class that I offer. And so that's basically the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the second member of the Trinity. He is undiminished deity as point one, but he also in his humanity. By the way, deity doesn't die. Deity is omnipresent. Deity is eternal. So he could only die in his humanity. Therefore, he is the God-man in hypostatic union. That's a big term that simply means he has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature in one person without mixture and yet at the same time having two specific natures in one person. It's one of the great conundrums of Scripture, yet the Scripture is clear that he functioned both out of his humanity and out of his deity. Sometimes he spoke from his deity. Sometimes he spoke from his humanity. Sometimes he spoke from both his deity and his humanity. We don't have time to go through all of those passages, but they are in the New Testament clearly given. So we have then, he died for our sins, he was crucified, and of course he was buried because uh, you don't bury living people. He had to be literally dead. Jesus Christ was literally dead. Some people say, well, he was just knocked out and he was in the tomb and he was still alive. And he went, whew, I feel much better now. And he got up and rolled away a 10-ton stone uh, and went out. Well, obviously, he didn't roll the stone away. In fact, it was rolled away later by the soldiers uh, to check on him and for the ladies to get in to uh, anoint the body. But they discovered he wasn't there. And so he didn't need the stone to be rolled away. He went right through the stone or through the dirt or whatever out of it and therefore uh, was uh, in an uh, interim body until he could be fully resurrected. So he was certainly dead. In fact, the soldier that put the spirit aside and uh, blood and water came out and that ensured the fact that he was dead. Uh, because otherwise they would have broken his legs as they were wont to do on crucified victims. So that to be kind, if you can imagine this, uh, when someone was suffering on the cross and said, put me out of my agony, uh, a Roman soldier might, in mercy, come up and break their legs. And when they broke their legs, imagine the excruciating pain, not just the hanging on the cross, but to have your legs broken. I don't know if you've ever had a broken bone, but you know it wasn't fun. Imagine having someone taking a large club and breaking both your legs. Well, the result of that was that you would fall forward. You could no longer catch your breath and push yourself upward, and you would suffocate to death. How humane. That was a wonderful thing that they might do for you uh, if you were suffering extreme pain. They would put you out of your misery and give you excruciating pain in the last few moments of your life. And then he was buried, of course, as being dead and was raised from the dead. And that, of course, is also part of it because if Jesus Christ is stayed dead, then he's just dead like any other human being and he's still dead until the resurrection but he didn't stay dead three days and three nights later he came out and got a resurrection body and we have understood that so to me that is part of it and in fact paul says that's his gospel here he says i delivered to you as of first importance what i also received that christ died for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture to me that is part 
of the gospel, point two. Number three, so he died. All of those things are important, but the idea is that he had to die, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, that he died for our sins, and therefore he had to die for the sins. Remember that the penalty of sin was death, and therefore somebody had to pay that penalty, you or I or someone. Well, no one could pay the penalty because it had to be someone who was perfect. Jesus Christ in his humanity was perfect, and therefore he could die for the sins. And John, of course, tells us that that's exactly what would happen in uh, uh, the Gospel of John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, he hadn't done it yet. That was a prophecy that he would take away the sin of the world, not cover it. Remember, in the Old Testament, uh, Yom Kippur is the day of covering. Sins were covered for another year. And every year the high priest would have to go and make an offering and carry the blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and see uh, if God would accept the sacrifice for another year. It's called the covering, the day of covering, the day of atonement. And therefore Jesus Christ did not cover sin. He took it away. He removed the sin and they were waiting, all the Old Testament saints, for the day when those sins that had been swept under the rug, so to speak, and had been covered over by the animal sacrifice would finally be expiated, paid for, judged, and carried away. So the sins were, I heard someone the other day, even a minister said, Jesus covered all of our sins. He did not. The Old Testament sacrifice temporarily covered the sin and they were swept under the rug until Jesus Christ, who would not cover the sins, but take them away. Sometimes I hear these pastors on television and they say these words off the cuff without realizing that they are teaching error and heresy. Jesus Christ did not cover our sins. He took them away as far as the east is from the west they will be no more. As a matter of fact, at the great white throne judgment, they will not be judged for their sins. But that's another thing I hear. Well, you go to that great white throne and God's going to judge and see if you have sin in your life. He is not. There are no sins judged at the great white throne. As a matter of fact, there's no sins judged at the judgment seat of Christ. It's a judgment of production for the Christian, for rewardability. At the great white throne, it's a judgment of works. The books of works are open, and everyone was judged according to their works. Not because of sin, because all sin, even for the unbeliever, the sin issue has been taken care of. He took them out of the way. Therefore, the only thing that they're judged for is their works. Do they have enough works to get into heaven? And Jesus said, no. There's only one work, and that's to believe in him whom he has sent. That is the Father sent Jesus. You must believe in him. That's the only work that gets you into heaven. You've got no other access to heaven. No work will accomplish it other than the work of Christ. And so we have here that Jesus will take away the sins of the world. And Peter, in 1 Peter 2.24, it says, He himself, that is Jesus Christ in his humanity, bore our sins in his own body on the cross. 1 Peter 2.24. We also see in Isaiah 53, 4-6, here we see the fact that the soul of Jesus Christ became a sacrifice for sins. And in 10.15 of Isaiah 53, his soul became a sacrifice. His body became the receptacle for sin. His total humanity bore the sins of the world. And... Uh, Obviously, we see that here as well. And then we see in uh, Luke 177 and Acts 10, 43, everyone, hear that? Everyone, that's the uh, adjective pas, all, everyone who believes in him has forgiveness of sins. Gee, in other words, the cross must take away the sins of the world. And as a result, your sins have been forgiven. So part of the gospel presentation is that Jesus Christ's death on the cross paid for the sins and therefore your sins are forgiven. That means that people need to recognize that they're sinful. We talked about it in the first hour. All have sinned. 
all, 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 and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, says it in the Proverbs, says it in Roman. All have sinned, and of course, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have turned away from God. There is none that seeks after God. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have free will. You do have free will. However, you can't make a legitimate a legitimate decision until the Holy Spirit comes into your life as an unbeliever and convicts you and makes the gospel clear to you so that you have a legitimate choice. Unlike the Calvinists who say you have no choice and God causes you to believe, we believe that the Holy Spirit makes the gospel clear even to the depraved unbeliever so that in that instant, they have the opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ. The Calvinists would reject that, uh, but they have they appeal to the same thing we do, the inscrutability of God. They say you can't understand the mind of God. Well, we appeal to the same thing. How does God make the gospel clear to a depraved mind? I don't know, but apparently he does. Otherwise, he coerces free will. And therefore, every imperative mood, believe, 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 uh, every... Uh, every conditional clause, if we believe, if we believe, none of those have any meaning if we do not have free will. Every all, every whosoever refers to the entire human race. So this is the one that Jesus Christ died and paid for my personal sins, the personal sins of every member of the human race, and they are forgiven somewhere in your gospel presentation that needs to be made clear. It can be assumed, but that's dangerous. It's best to include it just to be sure. Number four, God gives eternal life. Usually there's no arg argument about this. If you believed in Jesus Christ as the unique Savior, the God-man, uh, you have everlasting life. The passages often translate eternal life, which is really a poor translation. Keep in mind that the word in Hebrew and in Greek uh, that uh, deal with eternal life and everlasting life are the same words. But the context determines whether it's eternal life, which is God has eternal life, no beginning, no end, or whether it's human beings who have a beginning but have everlasting life. Now keep in mind that unbelievers and believers have everlasting life. The difference is where they spend that everlasting life after this life. Everlasting life for the unsaved will be in the lake of fire forever and ever. Believers will have everlasting life in the presence of God, in the presence of his son, Jesus Christ. I believe in the heavenly Jerusalem and perhaps throughout the universe that has not been totally disclosed to us. So he gives eternal life. This is the result of salvation. So far, we've noted the person of salvation. That's number two, the event that saves. That's the cross work. Number three, the work that saves, his death on the cross. And number four is the result of salvation. John 3.16 says, if you believe in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. Everywhere you see a believer that has everlasting life, if it says eternal life, it needs to be in context everlasting life. Sometimes I even forget and put eternal life. I need to correct. I think I even have it uh, once on here that I didn't change it. At any rate, he gives eternal life or better stated everlasting life. We see it in John 3.16. We always quote this, and there I've got eternal life. It should be everlasting life. I just noticed that. And so I'm going to go back and upgrade this as I go into the website. And then in pardon me, in 1 John chapter 5, 13, it reads this. These things, John says, I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, in order that you may know that you have, and then I would change it to everlasting life. First John 5, 13, and of course in John 7, 2 and 10, 27, it says, Jesus Christ gives everlasting life. He is the one. He has life in himself, John tells us in chapter 1. And in chapter 5, Jesus Christ has eternal life 
within himself and he gives life, that is everlasting life, to those who believe. Finally then, the last point, he alone, only Jesus gives eternal salvation. The only one, this is number five. So we have the person of salvation. Number two, the event of salvation, the cross. Number three, the work bearing sins on the cross by Jesus Christ. We have the result, which is eternal or everlasting salvation. And finally, there's only one who provides us, takes us back to number one. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the unique celebrity of the universe. He is the only one who can save. Muhammad can't save. Buddha can't save. Any of the Hindu gods cannot save. There is no other philosophy. There's no system of psychology. There's no system of work that can provide. There's no fallen angel or elect angel that can save. There's no human being that can save you. People often say, I'll save you. What they're talking about is maybe they can get you out of a jam and deliver you, but they're not talking about everlasting salvation. Only one person gives that. Jesus is the one. And of course, we have the great passage in Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only, only in the name of Jesus Christ. And of course, the passage we often use, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. By the way, a couple of caveats I wanted to mention here. For example, we talk about repentance in those first sections that we noted about giving a false gospel. One of the things is uh, repentance. People say you have to repent as if it's some second work of grace. In other words, first you repent, you uh, repent of your sins, and then you believe in Jesus Christ. Well, repentance, of course, can be coterminous with belief in Jesus Christ because metanoeo and metanoia means a change of mind. And certainly at the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you go from unbelief to belief. But unbelievers can be repenting. Uh, many times people in prison repent of their sins, repent of their crimes. I wish I hadn't done it. That doesn't save them. doesn't even get them out of prison. They just feel bad. And many times, of course, even as unbelievers, people repent. Uh, they feel bad because of something that they've done. That does not save. And, of course, believers, once they have believed in Jesus Christ, can repent. As a matter of fact, ought to repent. That is, change your mind about a particular sin. If you commit a personal sin, you need to change your mind, not realizing or thinking it was, and say, oh, I committed a sin. I gossiped, I maligned, I judged, I did something that is sinful, maybe an overt sin of something, even to the point of adultery or murder. Uh, these are not only sins, but crimes. Obviously, you can confess those, 1 John 1, 9. So you need to repent as a believer. So repentance as an unbeliever does not save. Repentance as a believer brings you back into a state of fellowship. Repentance at the moment of salvation is the change of mind from unbelief to belief. It is interesting that the word repentance is never found in the Gospel of John. Hard to believe. I know you'll look for it now. Look for repentance in the Gospel of John. It's not found because it's not part of salvation other than a change of mind. And so uh, uh, we also see that it's not found in the gospel and it is not found in first, second, or third John. There is no place. Uh, it is found twice in the book of Revelation. But you know what? In the book of Revelation, it's found as repentance of Israel during the time of the tribulation. They need to change their mind about the fact that Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so they are repenting, just as they did when Jesus was here, of their sin in anticipation of believing the gospel. So we have that. And then we noted the word whosoever that occurs, interestingly enough, the word whosoever, which indicates free will, occurs at least 110 times in the New Testament. Whosoever would indicate anybody, 
whosoever will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in John 3.16 as well. Well, I think that brings us close to our close. Uh, and so at that point, before I get back into Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, I think we're going to, we have that much time left? All right, well, I understand that we have more time. So that concludes that part of the study. And so we'll go back now into Philippians. So if we can regroup, by the way, that's where we were in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. And the last word there, that his imprisonment, Paul says, turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. We noted that it will occur again in verse uh, 16. And he says uh, the uh, people who are unsaved, uh, they uh, I'm sorry, the people who are saved give the gospel out of love knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Paul, of course, gives the gospel, defends the gospel, and gives reasons for it, especially as we noted in 1 Corinthians 15. And then in verse 27, he says here, as a matter of application, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith, that is the belief, of the gospel. Eight times the word gospel occurs. Well, we looked at that, and I do want to go uh, and uh, subsequently study the doctrine of the gospel. I am renovating that. You say, well, didn't we just get it? Yeah, we had five points, but there's more to the word gospel in the Bible, Old and New Testament, than simply phase one, believing in Jesus Christ. However, the next verse continues on, and it says this gospel, so that we have here the conjunction, uh, and uh, this conjunction introduces, again, this idea of imprisonment. So that the imprisonment of me... And by the way, it is plural, the imprisonments. Well, Paul was imprisoned in Philippi. The angels delivered them. You'll remember the jailer came and was going to kill himself because the cells were open. And uh, uh, Paul said, no, not to worry. We're all still here. And the jailer said, well, what do I need to do <laughs> to get saved? He figured he was going to get killed for allowing them to escape. And so Paul gives him the gospel, Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the jailer and his whole family believed. They went to the, Philippi uh, to the Philippian jailer's house. We don't know his name. I think it was Bob. Just kidding. But they went to his house and uh, they uh, uh, were baptized in water. And then they had a dinner there. Lydia, of course, uh, she might have even uh, been there as well. She was a believer, a seller of purple uh, dye and cloth, and therefore they made the beginnings of the great church in Philippi, one of the truly great churches, especially because they were prayerful, they were faithful to the word and to the ministry and giving to Paul's ministry as well. Great church there. And so it says here uh, that uh, my imprisonment, he says, so that my imprisonment, again, it is plural, so I suggest that he's either mentioning his bonds because he would be chained on one side to a praetorian guard and on the other side. So he was chained up with two guards, which he gave the gospel to every four hours when they would chain shifts throughout the 24 hour day. Or he might be referring to his imprisonment there in Philippi or his later two imprisonments in Rome and perhaps the imprisonment in Caesarea. So there was an imprisonment in Caesarea Philippi. Then there were two Roman imprisonments. The final one, once he went to Rome, he never returned back. And his final imprisonment, of course, led to the uh, execution of the Apostle Paul. But he says, my imprisonments in the cause of Christ, so that my imprisonments in the cause of Christ have become well known throughout the whole Praetorian the local police constabulary, apparently in Rome. Some suggest that he was in, um, in uh, Caesarea. I rather opt for the fact that he was in Rome, but there was a praetorian in Caesarea as well as in Rome. It's the local constabulary. It's the local police 
who incarcerated him in all these various locations. And so they, as well as everyone else, I think we got down uh, to the place where it says, clearly became revealed, that is these imprisonments, revealed the gospel, and to all the rest, everyone else who heard this information of the gospel. Verse 14, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord, because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Recognizing that Paul, under this adversity, was presenting the gospel, and as we see later in verse 18, he says uh, that the truth was proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Here he is in prison under adversity and all of his various imprisonments, and he rejoices because the gospel is increasing as a result. And not only that, people are gaining confidence. Therefore, whenever you have adversity, principle to take from this, whenever you have adversity, whatever it might be, physical malady, uh, environmental malady, it might be economic malady, it might be social malady, or imprisonment, whatever it is, that can be used as a platform to give the gospel and how you behave during those adversities becomes a source of encouragement and giving courage to others to share the gospel. So whenever we have any adversity, we ought to think of it as opportunity to share the gospel and to give encouragement and cause others who are not under that adversity to have courage, or perhaps those who have similar uh, adversity, maybe a fellow inmate or someone suffering the same malady of adversity that you will have encouragement and be courageous to present the gospel in spite of the malady or adversity. Father God, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to study these incredible truths. We pray that we might have a clear understanding of the essentials of the gospel of, a, of everlasting salvation and that we are clear in our presentation to any unbeliever that comes before us so that there's unmistakable understanding of what a person must believe in order to be saved. And Father, for that one person who's here this morning, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know that Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, undiminished deity, perfect God in every sense, became true humanity through the virgin birth. And not only that, but he was sinless. He did not have the sin of Adam. He did not commit any personal sins and therefore was a sinless sacrifice qualified to go to the cross, to physical death, to soul death, to bear the sins of the entire world once and for all time, once and for all people, and once and for all sins, so that those who would believe would have forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, and a host of other blessings and potential rewards. For God so loved the entire world that whosoever, anybody, anybody, all who would believe in him, believe what? That he is the God-man and that he is the savior of all mankind who believe in him would not perish, that is, be separated from you, Father, for all eternity, but rather have everlasting life and a host of other blessings as well. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John writes that the witness that he has given with regard to everlasting life, he said this life is in his Son, Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has this life. He who does not have the Son does not have this life. And he says, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for another opportunity to study your word, edify our souls, clarify the gospel in our souls, make us quick to give a clear gospel presentation to all who will hear it as you give us the opportunity. And we pray these things all in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
and amen.